Hi everybody, Todd Dan Occurrence here one more time. Today brought to you by Honer Musical Instruments, the best in the biz. I got a house full. Today, I'm very honored to have a very, uh, a, a guy that, one of the guys is the reason I picked up the bass guitar. Uh, this guy is a legend. He started the band back when he was like 15 years old and is still in it. They've been around for, I think it's 40 years now. That's mental to consider, isn't it? Ladies and gentlemen, from one of my favorite bands, Bad Religion, Jay Bentley. Too. Oh. I guess it tells you that just in case. For yeah, I'm leaving the meeting. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, just <laughs> delete. So I, 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 I'm so excited to see you. I, I, like, I like seeing all the gear. That actually makes me feel like, oh, it's coming back, baby. Have you guys got any, any plans, any dates, anything we cooking do. up? Okay, so wait, wait when is this, this going to air? Um, I'm not sure. Probably in a couple weeks. Okay, so, so we have dates. Uh, we, were set, we were scheduled to go out in March of 2020. Okay. Right when this started. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And, so and at, at ground our, zero. Yeah. My, all of our friends were, were, were out. Mm -hmm. We're just starting to go out and we were sort of sitting on the fence on this. And we just thought we, we really can't do this because yeah. we're gonna be out there and who knows what's going to happen. Yeah. So we kicked this can down the road and said, we're going to postpone until the end of the year. And then once everything sort of just exploded, it was like, we're post, we're just canceling. And so uh, the tour was really good. It's, it's us and the Alkaline Trio and War on Women. And the promoters all said, look, we love the package. We love this tour. So we're going to give you first hold on most of the venues whenever you want to put this out. Right. So we pushed it to fall of this year. And, and it looks like we're going to go out, you know, November. Perfect. October, November. Isn't it funny how it, because yeah, I'm actually kind of been giggling about this because it's sort of like, everything's like when you talk to people it's like trepidatiously baby stepping and then like within a day it's like boom millions of dates are being announced entire tours and i'm like holy cow this is really i had a i had a, I had a long talk with a couple of people about this feeling of mine which was uh for for people like us in in our industry which is basically live music live entertainment it felt like like a hand had opened the door and come in and turned off the light yeah. And you're sitting in this room in the dark going, what the fuck just happened? <laughs> yeah. And it's like, just wait here. And you're like, okay. And then that hand kind of came back in and turned the light on. And you're like, okay, what? So, <laughs> no warning what at all. What just happened? <laughs> yeah, I know. You know, like, like, I just was like, none of this makes any sense. And I was like, well, you know, it's it's because of what? Because of what? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, oh, I, okay, fine. Had I, I known, I mean, or had any of us known, you'd probably be like, well, we would have booked the tour for summer or, or fall. Now I you're mean, like going there, all the we way. Had a, we had an offer to play a show this summer uh, in February, and we declined because we said, look, the one thing that we didn't want to do was postpone or cancel any more shows. Right, it's, yeah. It's awkward, and it's just something that we don't do. It's like if we're smart enough to just stay out of that, then we're going to stay out of it. Of course. Uh, obviously, obviously, everything's opened back up. Yeah, I, I think that the the for us, everything that's kind of opened right now and that's happening is mostly outdoor festival. Yeah, we are the we are the let's put twenty five to five thousand people in a box. Yeah, yeah, and make yeah. get sick. So, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's why why we were probably sort of the last things to sort of that indoor not huge concert just you know the, the yeah. hollywood palladium kind of oh okay yeah exactly we're not yeah. gonna do that <laughs> <laughs> that's so funny i mean I, i've been thinking about this because i've always wanted to, to have this conversation with you because most of my friends and most of us have this sort of like you know it's that guy from and he's got like 10 things on his resume i'm one of those guys it's like he was in this he was in that but when you talk about you guys i mean literally you kind of have that dream thing of I always say, well, it'd be great to have just started a band when you were like 20 and then like still be in that band when you're 60 or whatever. And I'm like, but it's even crazier for you guys because you and Greg, especially and, and Brad, obviously, since you're fucking 15, 17, yeah. I don't know. You, you, you were 15. Yeah. And that's but that's literally like 
because you're the only punk guy, punk rock guys at school and you kind of like just band together and be, well, I right. guess you should just put well, a band you know, together. I, I think, well, listen, I, I had probably just turned 16. Greg was 15 and Brett was 17. Okay. So that's, and Jay Ziscrot was 17. The, I think that the, for us, what it was, was learning the lessons and making mistakes, but learning from them and, and not having that irreconcilable differences and knowing right. that you wanted to do something better than what you did last time and realizing that what you're doing has some validity that you can't put your finger on. There's something about this that just works. I've, I've played with many other bands. Sure. Yeah. And I've had a great time, but I always kind of, I always step back and go, but there's something missing that, that is inherent to bad religion. Yeah. Um, I, honestly, one of the best times I've had was was uh, playing with me first in the Gimme Gimmies just very recently. That right? was when the within the last five or six years, uh, and I didn't want to do it. And no. everybody said, you should go play with these guys, and I'm like, why? And they're like, because you'll you'll remember why you love playing music. Sure. And it was yeah. true. I got back in there, and it was just irreverent, and that was like you're supposed to make mistakes and gear doesn't matter and your <laughs> wedges are, are, you know, who cares? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I, I just, and I brought that back with me and said, like, I forgot how much fun this is. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it gets to a point where, where a band like bad religion would be a, a, a very sort of a machine that, that, you know, has its thing and it works night for night for night. And it takes away some of the craziness, but I, I would assume there's still some some wildness involved in that. You know, look, I, I always say like, you know, the, the the 90 minutes to two hours on stage a night is is what makes it all worthwhile. 100%. Yeah, so yeah. The other 22 hours are just spent. And for me, as like for a long time, I've been managing. And so that other 22 hours was sort of this stress filled anxiety bubble. And I, was <laughs> yeah. like, I don't know what I'm doing. Um <laughs> But I, I kind of just needed to get away from that and, and really remember that I, I how a how how fortunate I am to be able to do this for so long, uh, how grateful I am that that like this is the the funnest thing I've ever done and and I get to travel the world with my friends, uh, and that I really do um, appreciate this. I just was I I just started looking at it the wrong way, not because of the music, but because of the job part of yeah. It. Of course. Yeah. I mean, because you're, you're one of those guys that's a lot of us don't even have friends since we were 15 that we've kept in contact with. We, or, you know, you may have in a very sort of loose way, right. but the fact that you, you've spent more times, more time with those guys than most marriages, most, you know, even family members don't get to be together as much as you, you guys have. It's, it's, a, it's, there's, there's, there's some sort of dissertation you need to give on why this and how this has managed to stay together this long. I think it's mostly that we learned that we have to respect each other's outside persona. Sure. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of bands that I, that I know and run with, they, they, they tend to be this singular entity. Right. And I think that with bad religion, we sort of learned, it, it took us a while. I mean, obviously, after End of the Unknown, which was that prog record. Sure, yeah, yeah. After that, we really had to sit down and, and reassess what are we? What do we want right. to be? And that made it pretty simple for us to say, look, you know, we all have different likes, dislikes. Um, we all have different influences musically. Mm -hmm. And if we utilize our strengths and, and don't just, you know, look at someone like, why are you wearing that shirt? Because that's what you do when you're 16, 17 years old. You're going to wear your <laughs> shoes. <laughs> but, but once you get over that and you start realizing that the collective is is a strong unit, but we're not, we don't have a flag. We don't have a uniform. We're just guys that come together and really enjoy what we do. Because in looking back at that 1987, 1988, 89, it, it wasn't like, well, we're doing this for the money because there wasn't any money. It course, was just, yeah, we're yeah. just doing stuff because we're bored and, and this is fun. Yeah, yeah. Is and, that part of what keeps, I mean, I mean, even like in the early days of doing it in, in punk rock, I think the, the difference between being in like, say, like putting together some kind of Aerosmith type band thinking I'm going to have a model girlfriend in a mansion when it's punk rock, it's more like we're doing it for a completely different reason. Like there, there it, before Green Day and, and all that stuff, it was never really, there was never really a, a benchmark to look at and go, oh, we can have all these things or make a 40 year career out of this. 
No, there, I mean, you know, the, the only thing that you could think of were your local bands, Black Flag, Fear, Circle Jerks. You like those were the bands that you would idolize them. Sure. Yeah, and they yeah. were, you know, like, oh, my God, those guys are playing the whiskey. Yeah. yeah, was, yeah. That was as much as you could hope for it. And like, you know, I, I saw the clash at the Palladium in 79. But uh, I'll tell you how that the clash story. When I was oh, like 13 yeah, maybe me 13. Randy Rhodes and Quiet Riot came to my high school. What? And, and, and I wanted to play guitar. I had a guitar and I was like, oh, I'm going to be a guitar player. And, and I, you know, I'm sitting there looking at Randy Rhodes and I go, I'm never going to be that good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sort of this depressing sort of, oh, man, this is like. This I is had a, very I similar. Understand. I had a very and similar I, kind of take. Yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> and then, you know, cut to a couple years later and I'm at the Palladium watching The Clash and, and the Rubber City Rebels open and it was another band that played. And I remember thinking, I can do this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like yeah. this is, these are bar chords and this is, this isn't like, this is something bigger than just um, uh, talent. <laughs> <laughs> and I know, that's, I know that's a terrible thing to say, but that's kind of how it felt. But it's the same thing as as looking at like, you know, I don't know, Freddie Mercury and going, I'll never be able to sing like this. But then looking at Bob Dylan and going, well, I could probably do that. You know what I mean? But it's right. not to say Bob had a lot to say with what, however he was saying it. You but know? I think you I think what happens is you 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 kind of come around to that. Like I mm -hmm. by the time we did suffer and I tell people this all the time, I go, if you listen to the majority of suffer, it's just cowgirl in the sand on acid and speak. It's like, we're just, uh. So, so you, you kind of come around and find Bob Dylan and Neil Young and all these people that are saying what you want to say, but they're saying it in a different way than you sure. want to say it. We're just yeah. more aggressive. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, 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 you know, punk rock was and is sort of the, the, the Woody Guthrie of electronic music. It's just, it's the every man here, just grab, just play cowboy chords and, and speak your mind. A hundred percent. And I think bad religion is a good example of that because, you know, you guys really sort of separated yourself, at least in my memory away from everybody else. Well, plus there was the harmonies like that always to me, I know, I remember I hear, heard you re refer to somebody else that was doing harmonies before you guys. But in my memory, it was like, it was like um, bad religion had, a lot to say and they were saying it and you were saying it very nicely with like a really beautiful uh, blend of voices and stuff like that that was very unusual in in that field up to that point i thought in our in in the in in like 80 81 82 it was the adolescents right the adolescents they, they yeah. were doing they were doing three part harmonies on stage hmm. and it was uh it was beautiful to watch them i mean wow. they were they were the band that that should have made all of this because they were really the band wow i think i mean i see all the other bands like a man yeah black flag and fear and the germs and all that. i i get all of that but if you had seen the adolescents at in 1981 you would go yeah right the, the songwriting the harmonies the leads just everything they did was like that's a that's a really good band that's so cool it's so cool though, and it's such an unusual eye of the beholder thing that why did those guys do well but those guys just went away and it's probably but any I think number by, of reasons. by the time by the time we did anything with that knowledge it was 1988 right right and, right and you know the the southern california punk rock scene just went through a, a horrendous drug drought yeah uh, you know venues closed and yeah. there was just nothing to do and so most bands just you just fade away yeah, everybody by gets a time, job and a family. And I, I mean, I did. And and, and yeah. then, you know, by, by 1988, when we did Suffer, it's like, we didn't even, well, who were we making this record for? <laughs> yeah. didn't really, you know, and it no, didn't, know. we didn't care because we did we had this material and we liked it. And Brett had a record label in a studio. And it's like, okay, let's just do this. Of Why course, not? yeah, yeah. So going backwards, though, so you guys were Valley guys, right? Yep, all so of us. Which is really funny because, you know, I grew up in Canada. I don't know anything about anything, but I've spent so much time in California and so much time in, in Los Angeles with my friends. I had no idea there was this massive division between the Valley and the rest of like Hollywood or Orange County. It was sort of like the Valley was looked upon like it was, I don't know, a small town or something like no, my, my friend, my friend, my friend talks about like they would treat me like a hick whenever I'd go to Hollywood or something like that. It wasn't, I, it wasn't the hick. It was just like the, the chads. It was just okay. the, <laughs> the yuppies and the, and the, just the Valley was just kind of, 
It's so hard. Like Valley Girl, that Zappa song, Valley Girl, really kind of nailed it. It was <laughs> right. it, it just was like kind of kind of just not the I don't know. I, I it's hard to explain what the, what the rap <laughs> is. It's huge. It's not small at all. Oh, I know, I know. Yeah. So I, it's I, it's a it's so... just a huge tract of land. And, um, <laughs> Yeah, if you're from the Valley, everyone from Malibu to Hollywood to Orange County, they just hated you. <laughs> well, I, I, I find like, that oh. so bizarre. No, but I mean, it kind of, it helped us because it was just like, you know, we're, we're hated and we're from the Valley. Great. It gives us more stuff to write about. Yeah, yeah. I remember, I remember the discussion of like, this is bad religion from the Valley, you know, Keith would yeah. say or something like, like that. Like it was an issue. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, listen, here's this disclaimer, they're from the Valley. Oh, <laughs> yeah. oh. Okay. Like, oh, okay. <laughs> so you either lower your expectations or something. I don't know. Yeah, we just don't take them very seriously. <laughs> yeah. But I find that fascinating because, uh, you know, I just didn't know that about L.A., that there was such a because a, to me, it's kind of like, well, the Hollywood's just over the hill there, isn't it? I, it seems but the like, hill was the great divide. I, I, mean, I suppose. And, so, and, yeah. and, and it's sort of like that for everything, whether it's yeah. whether it's the beach communities, whether it's O.C. or Hollywood, there's there are hills that you have to cross. True. To get there. Yeah. And, and that, you know, that grants pass idea of like, we're going to have to eat somebody. <laughs> that, 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 that sort of that keeps everybody out it's like all right you know you got to make well, that trek over laurel canyon and is there like a, a sort of like an orange county scene a hollywood scene was there a kind of scene in the valley or were you guys kind of like the only game in town or there was a small scene i mean look there was you know obviously out in pasadena van halen was out there there was there was sure. rock bands every yeah. You know, there was a lot of rock bands. Yeah, uh, yeah. Lee Ding was out there. So there was some punk guys. There there were punk people. There just wasn't, to be honest, there wasn't really a, a thriving Hollywood punk scene either. Like everybody right. came from somewhere. Sure, yeah. I, I think that OC was probably the place that, that had the most uh, right. congealed pack of punks where it was right. just like from Huntington Beach into Fullerton. I think Skate, that was skater fun. kids and, and surfers. Yeah, and, and that you know, kind of... and then the, the beach kids were all the skater kids. It was, it, I think you could divide it between like the Hollywood punks and the Hollywood punks in my mind, they were a lot older. Okay. Yeah. They were, the, they were sort of the art guys who were there before us who just, sure. you know, punk to them was sort of just like smashing a typewriter with a sledgehammer. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> okay. And it, yeah. the, the beach guys were the more aggressive Right. violent guys and yeah. then and then the oc guys were the super talented guys and then there was us <laughs> it was like well, what are you guys ah, i don't know we're from the valley oh okay yeah sure yeah so <laughs> yeah, was sure. it quite as divided back then because you know when i i talked to friends who would be like if if you were a punk you couldn't go down like to the strip or certain areas when it was like a rock night because you'd get hassled or if you were a rocker you couldn't go on punk nights you know to areas because of you know you weren't wearing it's the true, right it depend it it's true but it depends on who you knew right right and and in my mind it was like band guys all the band guys it didn't matter whether you were you know rock band punk band if you were a band guy you all knew each other sure yeah because you're always handing out flyers, you're always just you're kind of out doing your job, mm -hmm. and so you get to know everybody in other bands. And it was it was more more the fans would have like we have an issue. It's like oh, I'm not I'm <laughs> I'm not getting involved. You guys go over to the AMPM and fight across the street. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. Yeah. The AMPM yeah, yeah. across the street from the whiskey was where everybody fought. It's like yeah, I'm not going over there. You guys. <laughs> yeah, I know it, it was always a scene happening over there. Yeah. Right. Cause no one like, like they wouldn't, you couldn't fight at the rainbow. You couldn't fight at the Roxy. You couldn't fight at the whiskey. So you just crossed the street. <laughs> Cause all the ones over there was the AM PM. And I, before hustler, there was like nothing. I think it was just a blank lot. I don't even remember. Yeah. Yeah. That's so uh, funny. But it's funny because so when you, when they started talking, Greg and, and Brett, um, you know, about, let's put a band together uh were you even playing music i was uh, the, the I myth was, the, the I, myth I was, I was still a guitar player oh okay you were a guitar player so, okay. so when uh when brett and greg met at a party brett was in a band with the original drummer jason discrout called right. the quarks okay and and so brett said i want to be in in a more aggressive band because the quarks was pretty new wave and and greg was like let's let's do a punk band Right. And they'd had a couple of rehearsals before Greg said, hey, we're, we got a band. You're in the band. We're putting you in the band. Because I was the only other one at school. And I'm like, oh, okay, I got my guitar. He's like, yeah, you know, you got to play bass. <laughs> I love that. 
all right, whatever. I mean, you know, but in all honesty, it was it was for the best because I wasn't a very good guitar player. You know, I was like, well, okay, what's bass? Like, oh, that thing. Okay. Yeah, but a lot of guys picked up the bass around that time based on, say, at least the image of a Sid Vicious or something like that. I mean, we, you know, that we as a kid, we didn't know who played on what or who who was playing what. We knew that guy looked bitching, and and Didi Ramone, of course, guys like that. You know, those were the kind of guys that we thought, like, okay, well, you hang it real low, right? Well, you fall into that category now of a million kids who picked up bass because they saw Jay Bentley playing bass. Well, yeah, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> it's your fault. Not, <laughs> yeah. I'm not taking any responsibility for that. Yeah, I, I think because uh, my early listening to music was was exactly that. I didn't know who did what. No, I, no. I really had no idea. Yeah. Uh, I think the only thing that I that I kind of knew was that D. Murray was the bass player for Elton John, and I right. liked him. And that's way back when I was a little kid. I just remember mm-hmm. there's a picture on. I think it's in Goodbye Yellow Brick Road where he's sitting on the grass and he's got his P bass there. And I was like, oh, that's cool. And I had no idea what I was looking at. Right, right. But it wasn't until um, I bought Kiss Alive yeah. where, okay, now I understand exactly who does what. Yeah, it even and, said on there because it said on, you know, lead right, guitar, and you, bass guitar. And you, and it, well, more than that, I think it was the fact that they're larger than life characters. Sure, sort of, yeah it gave you something to grasp onto other than just bass player. True. Here's yeah, the yeah. demon. Here's the space child. Here's the love thing guy. Here's <laughs> yeah. the cat. It's like, okay, yeah. I'm not the cat. Fuck the cat. <laughs> I can't be the love child because no, but I can <laughs> be Ace Freely or Gene Simmons. And so that's kind of where, that's how you like, I decide what I'm going to be based on their character. <laughs> on which kiss guy is cooler than yeah. the yeah, yeah. So, so like I'm Ace Freely five times for Halloween. And then Greg tells me I'm the bass player. And I'm like, fuck, I got to be Gene Simmons. <laughs> All right. All okay. Right. Yeah. Whatever. <laughs> So, but I mean, but also your skills, because that that other harmony is your voice, isn't it? It's well, yeah. It's it's Brett and myself and Greg. And Greg, yeah. Uh, you know, Greg is Greg is one of those guys that was like he he was in the church choir mm-hmm. and he just has a natural gift. He's one of those one take guys. He's like walks yeah. out, does one take, then does three harmonies, and then goes and has lunch while we're all struggling to get one <laughs> ooh down. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, we all just kind of what we what we learned over the time was that Brett and I's voice blend well together. Right. And so Greg would would nail his his lead and then double it. And then Brett and I would kind of go in together and try to make this one two part harmony. Right. At the same time. And that and that seemed to work. So that's sort of how we built upon that. It's such a unique sound, though. And I mean, I can't imagine you guys without that, even even because it's one thing to imagine because in the 90s, it became like when you lived long enough to kind of watch the alternative thing happen where certain vocals became uncool, like big kind of huge harmonies became uncool in the rock world. It was sort of like people would just kind of pare it down to, okay, well, we'll put one extra voice, that kind of uh, the Keith V um, Keith harmony kind of thing. But you would never have a third, you know, it just seemed like the third harmony made it too pretty or too Beatles or something like that. But you but guys always that, nailed that. But we, we were able to do that because we were sort of ugly on the outside. <laughs> we had this ability to go like, look, we play really fast, but we put these little sweet nuggets in there. Yeah. We had a lot of things going on. And, and, and you know, we just that we understood that we understood totally. that we were doing something completely unique. Totally. Um, we didn't know what it was, but we had always said, like, we want to make the music that we want to listen to. Totally. And that yeah. music doesn't really exist because just there just isn't another band doing this. And so that's that's sort of how we built all of this was like, OK, how do we make this sound in this in the same with, you know, even down to bass tones. My bass tone was like, you know, Brett and I were talking one day and Brett goes, well, what do you want to sound like? And I said, I want to sound like the low end of a piano through a Marshall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he goes, okay. And so we started just building this sound. Totally. Um, and and that's that was what I ended up with. And I just said, I love this. This this really feels like it it fits in with the music that we're doing. And it's unique unto itself. Yeah, totally. Yeah. So what? How long is it? What, what I've always appreciated about you know Bad Religion, Social D, all these kind of groups, the ones that 
still remain today. It, it there's no like like I said, there's no business model involved. There was no kind of like we'll do this for 30 years or or however long it takes. <laughs> you know, it's like <laughs> the fact that you're probably doing it for like three years felt crazy. But um, but I mean the whole you know, I talked to Duff McKagan about this all the time because he, he came up in punk rock in Seattle and there was that right. whole sort of like the touring schedule, the punk rock houses to flop in, all that kind of stuff, borrowing gear from this band and that band and the whole thing. So were you guys a part of that thing? And and for how long are you like sleeping on floors and sleeping in vans and all that kind of stuff? Like We, we were a part of that thing because that's that's just what everybody had to do was like, yeah, you, yeah. like we didn't do our, we actually didn't do our first national tour until 1988 okay wow so even though we'd started in 1980 we'd gone to san francisco we'd gone to phoenix i think we went to vegas once but at the same time we were kind of dumb kids and just going to school and it just was like a like the band was the band wasn't really the driving force in anybody's life it was just something interesting wow and um by 1988, when we did suffer and we said we should go out and, and play on the road, we had Greg and myself, Greg Hetson and Lucky Lehrer had done an East Coast tour, I think it was 1986, in a, in a, in a Vanagon with no windows in the winter. I mean, it was <laughs> totally miserable. And I said, I don't ever want to do that again. That sucks. Like that, you know, a Volkswagen, uh, one of those old, like a, like a seventies Volkswagen bus with no windows. Yeah. Like, yeah. Why am I here? <laughs> um, but, you know, we did that, that first tour was sleeping on the floor, driving in the van, you know, uh, the, 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 whatever the, the phone thing was, everybody had a, a, a fake phone number that you could call and get free long distance. Yeah. 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 Um, and, and by the time we did our next tour, Greg Graffin had said, I'm not doing that anymore. I'm not okay. sleeping on people's floors because it's like an all night party. You know what I like? It's oh, like, yeah. it's just, and you never sleep. And you're just like, by the, by the third day, you're like, I'm so tired. <laughs> you're like, oh, you only have 50 more days to go. It's like some kind of torture or something. Right. Yeah. It is torture. <laughs> yeah, 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 you know, yeah. You're 18 and you don't care. Yeah, so yeah. Greg was the first one to say like, you know, fuck you guys. I'm getting a hotel room. And I remember this. It was so funny because he he had a credit card. And we're like, where did you get a credit card? <laughs> <laughs> he went to some like Motel 3 and and got a room. And we all went in with him. We all went into the room and slept all over the floor, toward the bed in half. Some people on the box spring, some people on the mattress. You know, sure, one yeah. guy in the shower. Yeah, which and, is luxury then, compared to the previous tour. Yeah, Totally. And so the next <laughs> day we all went, okay, this is what we're doing. Okay. Because, because all of a sudden, it, we all, the, the five of us understood that like sleeping was way better than not sleeping. <laughs> yeah. It's funny. You, you took, yeah. it took an entire tour to figure that out. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. so then that happened and we just said, you know, we're not doing that anymore. And then a, a few, what happened was we, we hired guitar techs. And, and I was going to say, how long is it before, like when it's the five of you throwing gear and humping gear? The it was whole always me throwing gear. Always me. I don't know why I'm the Tetris master. I guess I can just pack a van better than anybody else. Somebody has to. Yeah. And so the third tour, we brought a guitar tech and, and you know, whatever, by the fourth tour, we had two vans, two U-Hauls worth of gear. Wow. And like, you know, eight guys. And, I don't remember where we were in some city and, and I was talking to somebody else in the band and they said, you know, an Eagle 10 is only like $400 for, for this Eagle 10. Right. And yeah. Yeah. I'm looking at two vans and two U-Hauls and I went, well, that's what I'm paying for these. Right. Right. And, and that was when I went to the guys and I said, so I know this is weird, but check this out. And I, and I laid it all out to them mathematically and said, we have two U-Hauls, two vans, which we're paying about, you know, four hundred dollars in gas and everything else, and we can get one of those things that we can sleep on and it has a bathroom in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and everybody said, let's try that. And that was that would have been ninety one. What album are you on by that point? We're on uh, Against the Grain. Okay. Yeah. 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 So so that just sort of that just opened up this whole other touring world and so by that point how many what guitar tech do you have a drum tech what do you what do you got on the road with guitar you? tech a drum tech a sound man okay a guy and a tour manager yeah there you go so you're so full we, we, the full ensemble yeah 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 and so we just we just went out and it was and it was 
amazing. Yeah, I bet. Yeah, it changes so, the game. Yeah, and so by the time we hit, well, it might have been Generator, but it was either Against the Green or Generator, but by the time we hit Recipe for Hate, we we had it dialed, and that's when, when we went out with Green Day, and they had the bookmobile, which was Trey's dad was driving that, and wow. yeah, we just said, we're never not touring like this again, because we can sleep, we wake up where we're supposed to be. And this just makes it that much easier. And it doesn't cost us any more than what we were already doing. So, and we never, we, that was when Greg started to realize that he was still in school. He was in Cornell. Oh, wow. Yeah. I forgot about that. Cornell and of all schools too. He wow. Was a full, a full-time student. Yeah. Yeah. And he was working on his dissertation and he said, I can tour like this a lot longer for more time than I could in the vans. Oh, 100%. I can that longer. I'm not just, I'm not just beat up. And so that was when he started making that decision to go out on the road longer and longer. Unfortunately, Epitaph was blowing up and Brett wanted to go on tour shorter and shorter. Sure. Yeah. And so these things weren't going to meet in the middle. And that was what happened in that. Yeah. I was going to ask about that because that's such a fascinating thing to have, to have put together a punk rock band. Like, like I said, with, without a crystal ball, knowing that, punk rock is going to become big business in any way, shape or form. I mean, no one really knew. And then all of a sudden that starts to happen, like with the younger bands coming up and you guys are sort of in a prime position to be kind of like one of the guys that can benefit from that. Um, as Epitaph starts to blow up, what I, I, I can imagine how uncomfortable that probably was in and of itself, but was, you know, as Greg saying, let's tour more and Brett saying let's tour less. What the, uh, the only way to compromise was Brett's going to have to sit this out um, yeah, unfortunately, we weren't old enough or mature enough to to sort of make Brett sit this one out like we do now. Right, right. So oh, we you, had, mean, you mean like just getting like a, a sub or a fill in or, or right. whatever? We had, you know, we had to have the blow up. You know, I'm going to make my boyfriend break up with me fight because it's like, <laughs> I, I'm going to break up with you, but I'm not going to do it because I'm not the jerk. I'm going to be so miserable that I'm going to make you break up with me. That was sure. <laughs> yeah, was, we sort of, we went down that path. That old um, trick, yeah. Yeah. And it, you know, it just, it took a, it took a few years for us to realize, no, 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 we're, we're, we're good as a unit. We're good yeah, with absolutely, Greg, yeah. both songwriting mm -hmm. and, and Brett doesn't have to come out on the road because we've got Brian. And yeah, I know. Yeah. So what year did Brian come get involved? 94. Actually. 94. See, Is it that long? Wow. Because Brian, I always think of Brian in a funny way, like the Ronnie Wood new guy kind of thing. It's like, yeah. I, I, he's, look, he's, he's been in the band forever. He's, I know, he's, yeah. But but I every now and then I go, look, new guy. And it's, <laughs> but he's not the new guy at all. And, no, not at all. You know, he's he's he came in to Epitaph doing a Dag Nasty Four on the floor. Right, right. That was when that was when he was when I first met Brian, like really met met Brian. Uh, cause I'd seen him playing junkyard at cat house a, a few times when I yeah. was working there. So I, I knew who Brian was, but I'd never really hung out with him. Right. And that was right around when we were doing recipe for hate, which he told me that's my favorite record, you know, and, and it just, it just all sort of organically happened that Brian yeah. was exactly the right person that we needed at the time when Brett said, look, I'm not, you got, fuck you guys. Right, right, right. Totally right. out. Yeah. So we knew we weren't going to, you can't just go find a songwriter, you know. Right. Let's go yeah, get that's... a songwriter. <laughs> but we can get a phenomenal guitar player. Absolutely, yeah. And so yeah. that was, that was the decision was just, let's just get Brian because he's he's just an amazing, amazing guitar player. He is. He's a solid rock guitar player with, with, with the great, with the right roots too. Like he has all the right things. Well, that, right. His, yeah. his pedigree is sort of like, well, we, we, we lost this person, but we gained this person. Totally, totally. Close yeah. enough. Close yeah. enough. How long was, I, I I probably should have researched this, but how long is that break between Brett's um, absence? Like how long does that go on Six for? Six years. Six years. Wow, it feels so much shorter than that in, in retrospect, but yeah. He, he's out in 2004 and back in 2001. But so, you know, it's out in 94, back in 2001. I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, wow. Yeah, that, that is. And it's a substantial amount of time because that's the Atlantic period. Is yeah. that when? And that's got... exactly when he was out was was for that entirety of, of our Atlantic existence. And that's so funny to me because this is part of that conversation about like imagining in, in the punk rock world of getting a major Atlantic deal i mean it's like you know that's it's one thing to be having a, a an indie label blow up we can that's yeah. something almost you can imagine happening because as the kids you know start getting into punk rock but when atlantic comes to your door and goes 
What about a real record deal? You know, that, that must have been a very interesting conversation. These, but this were, these were conversations that Brett and I were having when we put out Recipe for Hate because I think we put 150,000 units in the pipe. Like, that's right. just he and I with a forklift. Wow. Wow. And, and I remember Brett and I were saying, like, we're, we're too big for that. Like, bad religion is smothering epitaph. Right. Yeah, yeah. Like, it's, just, it's just overwhelming all the other bands. Totally, yeah, yeah. And we talked about like, well, we Brett and I said, let's let's go out in the world and see what we're worth. So we made the phone calls. We said, let's let's go out and see what we're worth. And we met with people and said, like, no, you're jerks. You know, <laughs> you know, it's, it's not. They just didn't understand what we were doing. And who well, we, I, I can imagine those people wouldn't get that yeah, because they don't see the they don't see the feet on the floor the butts in the seats the whole thing no, the, it was it was you know it was kind of like that very hey baby that that la thing you're like no nah, no nah, let's just go get a free lunch and just <laughs> yeah yeah right <laughs> um and it was danny goldberg who was nirvana and bonnie Raitt's manager yep. he was um uh, he at the time he was a and r for atlantic okay and, and he's who brett and i met and you know danny got it was, was the right guy totally yeah, yeah. got it totally yeah. got it and so it, it, I called everybody in the band and I said, look, I, we have the best of all worlds on Epitaph. It's our, it's Brett's label. It's our band. Like this is perfect. Yeah. But, but is there something better? Yeah. And so yeah. I, I just called everybody and I, I kind of presented them with this question. Like, would you want to move if you could? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And everybody felt like they, they didn't really want to, but they did see the necessity of it, like to kind of get to let someone else do the work. Right. Well, it's kind of like you, you developed a company together and like you say, what is it worth? It's that, that those are very grown up conversations to be having about. I, I was very, I was very honest about it. I said, listen, I'm, I'm driving the fucking forklift. My thumbprint is on every single record that goes out. Yeah, totally. Yeah. If I can do this, imagine what an actual label could do. Totally, totally. Yeah. We, we might get into Walmart. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Yeah, yeah. And and so it it, it all made sense. Um, uh, it just it just was it was we everything that happened in retrospect had to happen. I, sure. I think that the thing that happened between Brett and I hadn't happened that way, but it had to happen that way. Sure. Yeah. And you know, I don't think that we would have been able to stay on Epitaph and be the band that we became with Brian mm -hmm. because that's, that, that band is the touring band that we know now. It's, oh, it's 100%. the workforce that we know now. A hundred percent. Yeah. And none of that would have existed had we just stayed on Epitaph and sort of like, oh, and Brett's still in the band. And it's like, we would have been fighting and probably would have broken up. Yeah. So, yeah. so kind of, we just kind of had to have a break. Mm -hmm. and, and let everybody grow to their potential and when we got back together everybody was very comfortable in their positions sure yeah, Brett yeah. Was happy at epitaph we were happy being what we were as a touring entity and it was a perfect reunion of now let's start writing some more material and that was 20 20 years ago and how quickly when did brooks become part of that equation he was we bob uh on the very last tour that we were on with Bob, we were in South America and, and we played in Brazil. I can't remember what city we were in. And we just got done playing our last show. And Bob said, I can't do this anymore. Right. Just I, exhaustion. Just his shoulders were fucked. His symbols had just started dropping and dropping and dropping until they were just almost level with his toms. <laughs> just, and so understandable, uh, you know, I, I talked with Greg and I said, Bob's going to go. What do you want to do? Like, do you want to, do you want to go get another drummer? I, I don't know what we're doing anymore. We kind of just, we were circling the drain. Our records weren't selling very well. Right. Uh, we just didn't really have a, a purpose or direction. And Brian and I had said like, well, maybe we can get Brett back. This was just like a, like, let's try that. Right, and right, Greg, right. Greg had already been sort of work talking and, and they wrote that song together on uh the new america yeah yeah and so i went i flew uh, i flew, it's funny i flew from south america to los angeles hung out with brett for a while and said well we don't have a drummer because i knew bob was leaving mm -hmm. and so brett and i started calling josh freeze and travis and we just started calling everybody that we knew <laughs> saying 
what do you think? What do you think? And they all said the same thing. You got to get Brooks. He just left uh, suicidal. Brooks is the guy. Brooks is the guy. Brooks is the guy. And so we, yeah. we had drum tryouts with like four guys and Brooks sat down and as he sat down, he did a triplet and I said, he's the one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, you guys yeah. became, I mean, with, with, you know, especially Brian and, and Brooks, it was a machine, man. Like uh, Brooks yeah. is a monster drummer. Yeah. yeah. It, it, yeah. It, cha- it just changed everything about the band yeah. changed with, with this Brooks, Brian, Brett rewriting songs. Brett back in the fold. And I tell people this all the time. Look, I, I, I was allowed to sort of just flub my way through a lot of stuff for a lot of years. <laughs> and when Brooks joined the band, I said, oh, crap. And I just went home and started practicing with a metronome because I said, this guy, he plays things that I don't understand. Right, right, and right. Because, because he plays in such a way that I'm just a 4-4 four, four Ramones guy. Just, sure. I'm just playing and playing and playing. And Brooks would just get out there and be playing some mystery beat. <laughs> the truth is, is that he like Brooks is playing these amazing things, and then he always comes back. Yeah, yeah. But uh, but but I get suckered into it, and I'm out there standing in my underwear, going like, "Oh, what just happened?" Yeah, yeah. You, know, you know that feeling, right? Yeah, hundred like, percent. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> and so I just had to, I just had to re revisit everything from the beginning because he was just this he was this immense talent that I didn't understand. It takes it, the, it takes the musicality all up several yeah. notches because it makes everybody else step up their game too yeah we really did it really it really just it just emphasized what was possible going back to the atlantic thing really quickly um so what was the did you find yourself in the major label world like everybody else finds themselves in the major label world is there like an a and r guy breathing down your neck and constantly like no. how did that work was it, you guys you were kind of left to your own devices our a and r guy it was funny because our a and r guy was initially danny goldberg and then it was mike gitter uh, uh, he's a New York guy. He did uh, Roadrunner, and, and he he was at. Um, oh God, he used to do a magazine. I forget the name of it now. Blanking. Hmm. But all of the guys at Atlantic, they they sort of had this hands off approach to us. They said, "Look, we, to be honest, when we signed with Atlantic, we brought our epitaph contract to them and said, here's here's our contract. And if you can't get close to this, then we don't even have anything to talk about.' Right, right. So they they kind of understood. They're like, "Look, we're not a baby band, and we don't need someone to tell us what to wear." Right, and, right. You know, we're we're fine. Just yeah. We just want you to make these records and sell them. Sure. Yeah, yeah. We're fine. We got yeah. this. Yeah. And so they they pretty much they they would come and listen and go like, "This is great," and then they would leave. They, they never. That's leave. awesome, Mac. I was always kind of curious about that because you know, in nine times out of ten, it's usually like. You've signed with a major label, but now you've got to make some sort of deal with the devil that suddenly means, how do we take this and turn it into a, you know what I mean? It turns the into some other thing. thing. They ever, they, what, they, what they made us do was they made us spend an inordinate amount of money on videos. Yeah, back when right. the video budgets were nuts, yeah. Right. They like we would go like, well, we're just going to have our friend shoot it with a handy cam and it's like, no, no, you have to spend $100,000. Like we don't want to spend $100,000. That's dumb. I know, and we're like, right? no, well, we've, we we this is the director and here you do. and we're like, oh, for fuck's sake. <laughs> <laughs> we kind of that was the only thing where I would go but that's my money. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's you're, spending, the people, you're people, telling me to spend my money and I'm telling you that I don't want to and you're mad at me because it's like, well, no one will take you serious. Like, no one cares about us anyways. We're not <laughs> on MTV. Well, that is one of those things. I suppose the intention is they want you to look like if your video pops up between Madonna and whatever the other artist is, they want your video to be able to compete, at least visually. Yeah. But I knew that that was never going to happen. <laughs> but that doesn't <laughs> usually happen, yeah. We, you know, the the... It, the relationship that we had with them was was awkward because we were we were in the business as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And true, I could yeah. tell them, I go, well, here's how many records we sold, and here's where we sold them, and here's what yeah. we do in the Midwest, and here's our here's our radio spins, here's our college radio play. We don't get on MTV. We might get on 120 minutes if we're lucky. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, we don't really have a whole lot of impact there. Our thing is is we have a good fan base, people that really like what we do. Yeah. And so we just, that's what we do. So leave us alone and right. leave our fans alone and we'll yeah. be fine. Yeah. So we, that was an awkward relationship where they just said, well, we would just, we just want to talk to your manager. And I unfortunately, think- the manager that we hired at the time was just, you know, one of those managers who was just like, we're just going to go yell at people. It's like, oh, fuck. <laughs> Stop yelling at people, please. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> Come on. So how long is that basically how that relationship ended? You just kind of like thought, 
I mean, once the Brett conversation starts to happen and all that, it, it's sort of no. The Brett the Brett conversation didn't become real until uh, it was with Atlantic. It was three records, no, two records, option, option, option. Oh, I see. And, and they dropped the last option. And okay. the minute they dropped the last option, I told our lawyer, I said, write the letter. Because in order, if they didn't pick up the option on a certain day, we had 72 hours to write a letter to get out. Ah, perfect. perfect. They didn't pick up the option. And I said, write the letter. And, and so we wrote the letter and said, we're done, we're out. I'm always it's, impressed by your, because, like, you know, w in running a band like this, you can't have a bunch of jackasses. I mean, you can have some jackasses, but you have a guy like yourself who's actually cognitive enough to go, we need to write that letter. Like, you know, not a lot of people aren't that smart or that sharp or that on it. I mean, I just wanted, I I enjoyed the process. I was, I was enamored like everyone else with the idea of something bigger. Mm -hmm. uh, but after the second record and after kind of, dealing with this label that i mean to my face they would say like well you know you're not important anymore and we've just signed this band pod which is going to be way bigger than you to my face and i'm like god i fucking hate you why do you keep us and i and i'm i'll i'll say this out loud i asked them specifically i said why do you fucking keep us yeah 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 because you're a feather in our cap and we can tell other bands that bad religion is on atlantic so they would sign to us too and i'm fuck you guys i hate you it gives them their street cred yeah, right. yeah. we had and so we had to sort of suck that for a couple of years but the minute they realized like we're just gonna we're just we're not picking up the next option i said get the fuck out of there and we'll figure out where we're going next if we're going to go anywhere but we just sure. have to get off this label Totally. And then you're, and then, but then the, the idea of taking control of your career again is, is presented itself, I suppose. Uh, it sort of, because at the time, our relationship with Brett was still unknown. Right, right. Our relationship with Epitaph was still unknown. And, right. you know, uh, you know, Greg said, well, we can just go across the street to Sony because we were good friends with Michelle Anthony. She liked the band and we're like, well, let's go talk to Michelle. Sure. You know, Pearl Jam's our friend. So we have yeah. friends over at Sony. We're fine. Mm -hmm. And then there was there was this weird talk of like, what if we talked to Ian and got on Discord? Okay. Yeah. How weird would that be? Yeah. And that mic had fat records. It's like, well, that's a weird, that, how, that would be weird. But <laughs> maybe that's where we belong. Like maybe. Right. And that was how the truth is where bad religion really does belong is on Epitaph. Yeah, there is no better fit for this band than that label because mm -hmm. yeah. we are we are we are joined at the hip. Totally. Yeah. And and once once the discussion with Brett and everything was just it it was like all of the movies about homecoming that you've ever seen. <laughs> that was it. It was like okay that that whole like we were lost in the wilderness for six years and we <laughs> made it home. It's like woo, we did it. <laughs> No, I, I, I mean, we felt like that too from the outside looking at it. It was really exciting to see, you know, I mean, because I actually really love that period because I love Brian as a guitar player and that whole thing. Right. But, you know, when you all of a sudden you add Brett back in the equation, Brooks is in the equation, it becomes a whole other machine by that point. So Brett's involvement is sort of when he's when he can do it, he, he does it basically. I mean, he, he writes and he records. The, the, but look, we... we we wrote the process of belief probably mm -hmm. just like we did suffer. It just, mm -hmm. it just materialized. Right. And we went in the studio and got that done really quickly. It was very exciting. Brett was really excited to be back in the band and he came out and did a full world tour with us. And at the end of that tour, he said, I'm never doing this again. I left <laughs> my label, like everything's broken. And I'm like, dude, I, I'm so glad you came. I'm glad you had a good time. You don't ever have to do this again. We're fine. <laughs> Uh, but he tried it. He was really excited. Yeah. And he's like, I can't do that. But, <laughs> you know, it, it, that sort of set the tone that we could have had in 94 of like, you don't have to do this. We're, we're totally cool. You, you write right. these songs, you do the studio production, you run mm -hmm. the label, like you do all these things that, that we can't do because we're out on the road doing this thing. Right, right, right. And so, you know, in this sense, it became, that was the, the, the perfect bookend to a business where, the guitar player who writes the songs is the label. So while we're out doing the work, he's doing just as much work at yeah, home. Totally, totally. It's, it's and it has been like that ever since. And he has a vested interest, and in, and you know he's got your back. He's got because you know, he's part of the equation. It, it yeah, means 100%. a lot to him. Yeah. This is this is this is 
this is his legacy. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. and, and it's, it's, you know, now you can sort of use the pun. This is our epitaph. There you go. And that, that is true because as much as epitaph is his legacy, uh, we will always think of Brett as the guitar player for bad religion at the end of the right. day. You know? Right. <laughs> you know? oh, it's just, it, it's, that's, that's what got everything. That's what got everything for him was his ability to uh, market bad religion. Yeah. Was what gave him that instinct to market the offspring or totally. rings or no effects totally. or whatever. Yeah, and I suppose the epitaph you returned to was a was a different epitaph than what you had left. It was the beginning of what it became to some degree, I suppose. You know what? There was a lot of people that were there when I, when we left Jeff Abarta, and and you know they, they they changed buildings, but for for all intents and purposes, it was that same home. Sure. Label. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's exciting. I mean, you know, it's it's such an American dream having you know, a record label, whatever, but bad religion, all those kind of things I look at as being like, like I said, you go into these things without any intention of being, you know, a grown ass man with grown ass children and thinking I'm still doing this, you know, we still got to, right. you know, we still, and loving it and, and enjoying it. And, and it's so much better than imagining, you know, because there's always that sort of thing where you, that parallel universe where you, you married your high school girlfriend and you work in a mill, you know, or something like that. You know? Right, right. Yeah. And you could have played football and it just, I, I think for, for us, the, maybe the, the, the fortunate part was, was Brett's business acumen in the sense yeah. of, of making records and selling records. And then, you know, our ability to understand that once we got out on the road and you could see like that man just handed us $500. Right, right. Yeah. And, you know, you kind of squint and go, we could do that again tomorrow night. Yeah. Yeah. And you start, you know, you just start this, you start this, this business idea, which is, I, I tell people this all the time, bad religion is fortunate in that we have the ability to wear different hats at different times. Totally. When it comes time to write the material, we don't ever talk about business ever. We talk about creativity. We talk about poetry. We talk about the cosmos, you sure, know, yeah, we yeah. really get into the art of, of this and we make things that we love regardless of whether we think anyone will like it or not. Right. Once that product is done, we can switch hats and go, okay, now we've got this widget to sell. Right. Right. And we're no longer talking about the cosmos. This is me putting on my squinty face and go, give me $500 motherfucker. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Pay me now. <laughs> so, that that sort of I think that that's the part of the the business of the band that we learned in the in the mid '80s because we were playing these sold out shows at the country club and at Fender's yeah. and they were giving us two hundred bucks and and I'm like there was a thousand people in here that they paid five dollars each that's five thousand dollars yeah yeah so I would just start going like no we want twenty five hundred dollars and they go what and I go yeah we want half the money yeah yeah and they would yeah. give it to me and I'd go. Oh, this is really cool. <laughs> this, this actually worked. Yeah, I mean, that's. The, I, I honestly feel like you should you should put this into a book because I think most people think getting in a band, they don't think of it as a small business. You know what I mean? Like your you, your biggest concern is someone stays sober enough to get to drive the van to the next town, right. and 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 just party and and all that kind of stuff. But the actual ability to one of the biggest reasons a bad religion is still around is somebody. Uh, the collective of you um, were able to kind of see a bigger picture and to, to be able, like you say, look at a situation and go, if there's this many people at this show, we should be making X amount of dollars. Right. Why is that promoter guy making all this money? They're here to right. see bad religion. You know what I mean? Right. You take a few of those hits and then you learn your lesson. You're like, wait a minute, that's, that's not right. But you know, not every band has that person and that's okay. Um, you know, there's, there, there's something to be said about the creative poet, the person who like, I don't, I don't want to think about business. I don't want to think about dollars and cents. Well, that's true. Yeah. yeah. And extra large t-shirts. I just want to <laughs> write songs yeah. and, 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 and play my emotions. Yeah. And I, I hate to say it, unfortunately, these are the people who get eaten up by management because mm -hmm. There, you know, management just sees this as a as a meal ticket. This is just a workhorse, not every and, and they'll squeeze card. every cent out of it. And sure. then I'm going to put you out on the road for nine months, and I'm just going to, you know, and then and then and when you're out. when you're done, there's somebody else right behind you to do it. Yeah, I'm always very clear with everybody because one of the things that I always understood is this is the only thing that I have. 
this band is is my only thing. 100%. Any manager, any tour manager, any merchandise guy, anybody, really, you have many other bands that you work with. Right, right. You have many other things that you that you can kind of come and go with. If you don't respect this band as much as I do, and I this is all I have, yeah, then you can't stay. Right. Right. And that's all I ask. And so everybody that works with us, they they totally get that. They they understand that this is a precious commodity. Yeah, it that's really not, is. It's not an unrealistic thing to ask. I mean, it literally is your baby. And it is, if, but it's not. But it is in this world. It you know, is. Yes. Because usually, yeah. a, as a baby band, what happens is you get told you are nothing. I'm going to make you something. Mm -hmm. Therefore, you owe me. Yeah, yeah. And that that O never ends. Yeah. That debt is never paid. And you're just, you end up sort of just making someone else a lot of money. And this is your, and then your band ends and you don't get to do it again. Exactly. Because, yeah. because we've all had those like, wow, that was a great year. I, I did this one thing and it was fantastic and I could never repeat it. I know. Such a crazy thing. That's the, so at what point does Mike and Jamie get involved? I know that they're kind of like, it, it seemed to happen like together, but I know it wasn't because Mike came along with, uh, with Mike, came in in 20, Mike came in in 2013. Uh, we were just, we were having some, some fundamental breakdowns in our live shows. It was just like, it just wasn't working uh, as a five piece. You, you just like, you just, you're relying on everybody to do their thing. And it's like, this, this isn't working out so well. And so, Mike came in to help us and Mike's Mike's pedigree and Mike's Steve Jonesness and 100%. Johnny Thundersness was just like you're kind of exactly what we need. And he's a phenomenal Mike, guitar player. Oh, Mike was always that guy and for people who don't know was in the cult for like 20 years as this forever. kind of invisible forever. Forever. <laughs> invisible guitar player in the back and I'm like that guy's so awesome like yeah. I I jammed with him once in Calgary he just got up to jam and he goes hey man do you know uh up around the bend, but more like the Hanoi Rocks version. I go, fucking A, I know that. And we, and we jammed it. And it was like, I go, no one ever asks for a Hanoi Rocks version of something. Right. But um, no, he's like, when I saw him join you guys, I was like, so how did you come in, in contact with him? Was was that he, via, he's via the cult? With, or? He's been friends with Brian okay. uh, on and off for years. I mean, this is this goes back to that, um, that 89 metal world that the LA the, yeah. the LA scene sunset strip thing or whatever yeah. yeah and so you know he and Mosier and Brian they all they were all in the bands and I don't even remember what bands they were in obviously Brian was in Junkyard and, and I yeah. don't Mike like Mike was running with Steve Jones yeah that's, that's right yeah he was with Steve that Jones, was really yeah. where what mm -hmm. Mike's thing was so he was running with Jonesy which got him into the cult and and right um it just it, we when when we when we said we need to find a guitar player, Brian and I talked about we had to find someone that was sort of outside our bubble. Right. Because I don't know if you know, but like we've been a band long enough. And when you pick one of your friends from inside your bubble, all your other friends in the bubble go, why not me? Uh, yeah, that's the worst. And you're like, oh, man, I'm like, how do we pick one over the other? <laughs> yeah, that's the worst. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. So we said, let's let's go outside the bubble because that's unquestionable because it's like, yeah. no, we pick this guy based on his on his pedigree and, and yeah and, and ability mike, and yeah mike just really fit the bill and the funny thing like you said he was in the cult for so long as like that invisible guy that when brian was like you take the solo on this mike's like me <laughs> you, want, you want me to solo and we're like yeah you do that so so now it's like if you come and see us now mike's got half the show and he's just He's just in heaven. I'm like, God, you're so good. I know. Yeah, he's he's. I was. I would always say that about. It. I go. That guy's the, the the best unsung guitar player out there. Period. Yeah. I always thought he was like the best. I'm so happy to see him like shine now up yeah, with you guys. It's, yeah. it's really and and now you know we we finally got a record out with him and Jamie. Yeah. So now we're we're back to being that cohesive. We are the band that works. Uh, Brooks. Brooks left in, oh God, was it 2017? Yeah, what's he in? He's in like Avenged? He's in the Avenged Sevenfold. That's so crazy. I mean, so, good for I, him. I mean, That's... it's funny because I know the Rev said how much of an influence Brooks was. Wow, there you and, go. And, and, I, I, and I just get the feeling that like they went, you know, when he passed, which was super unfortunate. So sad. And they, and they I, I don't know how many drummers they went through. A lot. Yeah. A, a few and and i know that like i think that it, in the back of their mind they thought like brooks is really the only one who can take that spot yeah yeah and so yeah. they I, 
I think they would, they had just been talking and, and, you know, we have a lot of mutual friends in each other's camps. Sure. Yeah. And so, uh, we were at the end of that, um, we were at the end of one tour cycle and Brooks just kind of pulled everybody aside and said, Hey, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to go. I've been in the band a really long time, been in bad religion a really long time. I think I've done everything I can. How long I, was he in bad religion at that point? Well, from, from 2001 to 2017. Wow. Yeah. That's a long time. It's a long time. He's and a young, so, and he's a young dude. Yeah. Right. And I, I, I didn't disagree with him. I, I said, you know, you're totally right. You know, you, you've really kind of, you've, you've made this band into something that it wasn't before. Yeah. Yeah. And, and of course he leaves some big shoes to fill. He did. Well, yeah. Almost impossible shoes to fill. Mm -hmm, yeah. Right. And so I, and I wouldn't expect anyone to even try. To right. Be honest. Right. No, but Jamie's fantastic. Jamie I mean, is fantastic. When yeah. we had, you know, when, when, when Jamie came in, uh, he just, he had his own style mm -hmm. and it was really funny because when we first decided to write out a set list, a full set list to play and I gave it to him and he showed up at the rehearsal and he played it just like Brooks. And I said, did you watch a YouTube? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, right. I all these live shows and I said, you don't play like that anymore. And he, and he looked at me and I said, I want you to go back and listen to the records. Right. Right. And so songs with Pete on them, play them like Pete songs with Bob on them, play them like Bob songs with Brooks on them, play them like Brooks, but I want your take on all of these. I don't want you to play what Brooks thought of them. I want That's you actually very, very uh, mature of you. Cause a lot of guys, I've noticed this in any sort of heritage acts, you know what I mean? Bands have been around forever. It's kind of like they bring in a new guy and he sort of learns the board tape from the night before, right. you know what I mean? And, and I think that sometimes it, it becomes carbon copies of carbon copies till eventually the version you're playing is so far from the original version that it's kind of like, and, and, and you're right. And it yeah. was, we had, you know, Brooks, Brooks has his own style. Oh yeah. And you know, he could play things just in he, whatever. He's just, yeah, just, he's, magic, yeah, he's... Just, just magic stuff. But you know, there, there is something to be said about the way Pete played about the way Bob played. And so it, you know, Jamie kind of went home and uh, I mean, I, I have nothing but admiration for Jamie. He went home yeah. and did his homework came back and we went out on tour and played these shows and people were like, Oh, it's too slow. And I'd go, go listen to the record. They go, Oh my God, you're right. 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 Like, we've just been so used to this like frantic pace. It's yeah. really, I'll tell you a story about Brooks. It was really funny. Like I was like, I got it. We, 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 I said, look, I, 90 minutes, 90 minutes. We're on stage for 90 minutes and then an encore. And so I think I was up around 32 songs and and we were still clipping like 118, 120. And I'm like, huh, that's so weird. So I'm like 35, 37, 118, 120. I'm like, huh, 39, <laughs> 118, 120. And I'm just looking at Brooks like, oh, you just keep, like, I keep adding more songs and you just keep playing fast. He's like, yeah, I'm off stage in 120. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> I, I should have just played less songs than slow it down. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Just making more work for yourself. Yeah. I, I was. I didn't, I didn't <laughs> yeah. think that's what I was doing. <laughs> That's a, but that's a that's a very good indication to how how good he is. But I like I say, I think the band, you know, in and of itself, whether you know his absence or not, I still think the band is is probably better than ever uh, with the lineup it is right now. I think that you know, as I just think it's it's different without Brooks, but at the same time, it, there's it's it's so it's a cohesive unit, it's a machine, and I haven't seen it with Jamie live i've seen you guys i pay right. attention on 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 youtube all the time and that kind of stuff but i've never i haven't seen you guys live with 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 jamie yet but uh i, I think would, it's i, I think it's super more, strong I, I think i would feel i would feel remiss if jamie struggled with with brooks's parts right but jamie has figured out a way to play those parts that works for him that works yeah. for all of us and it yeah. works for everybody it's like okay because he came in we were doing i remember oh, this was the funniest thing he came in and said, oh, I don't have a double kick. Is it okay if I play it on the floor, Tom? And I started laughing and I go, yeah, sure. And he did it. And I went, oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, okay, never mind. You, you're, you're that guy. Cause he yeah. is that guy. Jamie's one totally. of those guys where it's like, oh, you're that guy. Yeah. You're, you're, <laughs> like, you're that guy who just, you just keep getting better and better and better. I love it. I love it. Yeah. No, I think that, like I said, I think the band is in, in its own way. Uh, the beauty of it, the fact that you and Greg and Brett have been together for, well, it's 41 years now. <laughs> you know, the group's been years. together. That's insane, dude. That's yeah. longer than, I mean, when you consider like, well, it's it's a matter of time before this Rock and Roll Hall of Fame nonsense comes knocking at your door. No, not for us. Yeah, I don't know, dude. 
I, I, you know, my, my, my dream, this is my dream in case anybody's listening. <laughs> real, I, I really want to get a Grammy for best new artist. <laughs> that's, Absolutely. That's, that's my dream. Like, I just, like, best new artist is like, yeah. <laughs> 50, 50 years later or something, you're like, <laughs> totally. That would be, that would be like, oh, I'm so happy about that. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I know all that other stuff is kind of nonsense. And that's what I, I think I really, I, I'm the kind of guy that I look at a, a band like yours and I go, that's the dream. That's the dream to be able to kind of like, is, the root, not the routine is the wrong word, but like knowing that you've got this thing and, and you do it, you put your time and energy and your love into it. And every year you have a new record to make and a new tour to do and all that kind of stuff. It's never been about the mansion and the pool and the, and the, the Ferraris or anything. To me, it's like, I don't really, ever really cared about that stuff. What I wish I had is that band like you, where I was like 15 years old and I'm still playing with those guys. And I just know what we're going to do. And we're going to do it because we love it. Not because it's, I mean, of course there's a business aspect to it, but I mean, it, it's different that, you know, you're not going out there kind of going like, hey, here we go, put on your apron and go I make mean, donuts. The, the business aspect is only because somebody has to do it. And if yes. you're not paying attention to the dollars and cents, then someone else is. Yeah. To it's, your it's, dollars it's, and cents. It, yeah. It's certainly not the driving force of everything that we do. No. Uh, I, Sometime around the 90s, maybe late 90s, I think this might have been on the Atlantic, but we started talking about how as a band we feel. And we were all, I think we were doing an interview and I equated it to uh, the Edmonton Oilers with when, sure. when it was Gretzky and Messier. And I said, look, there's, there's a point where there's five of us and it's like, we all know each other so well. We've been together for so long that we are this machine that loves to play what we play. We mm -hmm. don't show up at the hockey rink with broomsticks or baseball bats. We show up <laughs> with hockey gear and we, this yeah. is what we do. Yeah. And we really love it. And, and we only want to get better at it. Our whole goal is to just get better at this. Totally. And you know, people, what's your best record? What's the best record you've made? It's like, well, hopefully we haven't made it yet because the next one, yeah. the next one, because yeah. otherwise, why would we ever make another one? course yeah 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 and, and i, I think, look back and say these were great records in retrospect but you know and yeah. and i can say these were terrible records in retrospect but this wasn't a very good record yeah but you, you, you guys never sit around talking about like retirement and like anything like that do you we I mean, do I mean, we do oh, do you really but, but that's that's only isn't that a very real conversation that you want to have i mean it started well, with like we're never going to go on a farewell tour because what if you get together two years after that, which everybody has done, and you're like, I don't want to do that. Well, because then the money goes up, and you can't say no to the money when it when it goes up like that. Yeah, yeah but, that, but you know what? Then it, you just leave a bad taste in everybody's mouth. That, but I appreciate I appreciate you saying that because most people don't have the wherewithal. But I mean, it's a fascinating thing because none of us really assumed looking at Jagger or looking at Paul McCartney. None of us assumed that, you know. Ringo Starr's 80 years old and has dates coming up. You're like, what? That's a thing? You know, I mean, that, I know that you, a band like yours, it's like trying to imagine playing at that energy level and that pace in your 70s and 80s becomes kind of like, mm. <laughs> I, I don't think that's possible. And, I, and, and uh, I'll, I'll tell you the conversation that we're having right now, which was starting in 2020 because that was our 40th anniversary. Right, right. And so what I had said was, starting in 2020, we, I, I was going to start trying to implement a five-year plan. Okay. And that five-year plan... Hasn't it always been a five-year plan? I always heard you say that. <laughs> yeah, but it was like, we're going to be together for five more years. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, now, yeah. now I'm actually looking to the future of yeah, five years past. Yeah, yeah. So, we, you know, I said, let's go from playing 120 to 140 shows a year sure. down to 60. Okay. In five, in five years, not right now, right. in five years. Because, mm -hmm. you know, like, it's just hard to be out on the road and do this and night after night after night when you're, you're like, okay, I just, just uh. yeah, I know, I know. My knees <laughs> or whatever, right, right. <laughs> insert and, and, issue. Yeah. It's also, I think there's also something to be said about, you know, when, when people say, oh, I, I wish you would play the whiskey. Yeah. I mean, we've we've played there thirty times. I'm sorry that you just see us play there. Well, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. Play big festivals now. It's like yeah, that's kind of our job. That's what yeah. we do. We make these records. We play festivals, and every now and then we'll play the Troubadour, you know, on some anniversary show. Yeah, sure, yeah. But but generally speaking, that you you sort of want to start having an. It's not necessarily an out, but a a more comfortable way of doing this and having fun with your friends. And honestly. Totally. 
it's it's the warp tour ideology which was i'm going to go spend the summer with my friends and have a good time totally i don't care totally. what city i'm in i don't care what dirt lot i'm in here's my 35 minutes on stage and i'm going to go have fun with my friends absolutely yeah and so that's sort of at the end of this it's like well, let's just go have fun with our friends i mean we see like like out in europe or wherever we are yeah. we, we always end up seeing our friends and saying like, hanging out in the food tent totally yeah, yeah. Totally. i would yeah. rather just i would rather just kind of focus on that than sitting there with a you know with a with a with a map and a calendar and a calculator going like okay well we're going to do these 165 shows it's like uh, i know i know but I mean, you're you're in a very fortunate position be sitting in a tent having coffee with you continuing this conversation <laughs> exactly which will happen which will happen right. but i i appreciate that. i mean you're you're in a very fortunate position to be able to at least have that conversation and make it a reality because you you can play as much as you want or as little as you want probably I, I mean, yeah, I, we know that if we if we just if we just got in a bus and said, okay, well, let's just take all of the offers that come in, we would never right. come home. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, because yeah. it, it it is that it's just like, yeah. oh, they want you next week, they want you tomorrow, they like you can go do yeah. this. You, okay, well, we have yeah. to just say no, which is you never want to say no. Of course, yeah, but you I mean, we we have we, to. we are sort of programmed to not say no until you get to a point where, like you say, it's like you need to figure out how to do this wisely and smartly and maybe you know because eventually you get to a point where i really don't think there's anything ridiculous about playing rock and roll when you're old because i think it's 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 such an awesome thing that we are getting to that point where you know i think watching the rolling stones is sort of like that's the litmus test the first rock band to get old you're like well there it is this is what you can do if you decide right. you want to do that but right. but it's different to it's different doing bluesy type rock um versus high-paced punk rock unless you continue yeah. to replace drummers until you're like you know I mean, that, yeah. we kind of we wear them out that's for sure <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I am a huge advocate for rock and roll should be dangerous i really am i i, I still I firmly so. believe that rock and roll should be dangerous and you know in my pea brain i still feel that i'm 16 years old out in the valley in the garage yeah I, totally I, I have that energy and sometimes my physical being says that's not going to happen. But I, <laughs> I don't care. I fall down on my face. I just say, I don't really, I'm going to go do this. And I think as long, and we all agree that like, as long as we feel relevant, which sure. is important, mm -hmm. that, that we're not just out there, like we're on some history lesson. Right. <laughs> yeah. As long as we feel uh, that we're, that we're having fun and that, and that our material is, is not super dated and, and, then we're going to keep doing this. Absolutely, yeah. There's no reason. There's no. We don't. We don't see the reason to stop doing this for you know, uh, for any reason. No, and but so in the immediate future means November. November's the next dates for you. I think. Think? I, I think October, November. Okay, cool. That's, so and that's, that's kind of what it's what it's looking like. And how long are those? I mean, how long are you slated to be out now? This one is. This one is. I think it's just a little over six weeks oh, okay so yeah which you know i mean look we haven't played a show we won't have played a show in almost two years right right yeah. other than the, you know we, we we did the we did the shows at the roxy but that's not the same as playing a show yeah you yeah know, that it's not that energy and uh and you know we we we've sort of eased into that like well in the states we do like 21 days and then we go home and then we do 21 days and then we go home and now we're going to go do six weeks it's like that'll be tough yeah, yeah, but, I know. Whatever it is, what it is, and then next year uh, I, we're looking at like eight to ten weeks in Europe. Great, great. And as you yeah. know, it's like if you've got a tour in in post COVID times, keep it. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You cancel it, you're not going to get another one. No, I know. I know. It's like everybody and their mom is out on the road right now, and and every venue is fifty deep on holds. I know, I know. And it's... if you're like, oh, we don't want to play that festival, they're like, that's fine. We've got a thousand people. <laughs> it's like, just take it. <laughs> I know. It's 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 they're going to be the roaring twenties for that. You know, everybody was kind of like, I'm not sure if this is you know this is going to really adversely affect the touring market. I go, I think the day the door opens, it's going to be like 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 just sitting in Los Angeles, it's going to be like, which five bands do you want to go see tonight? And then tomorrow night, there's five more that we you know who who should we go watch? It's yeah it's exciting to watch it happen. And I, and I'm really excited. I, 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 I think I probably dragged this out long enough. I, I apologize for keeping it. I could, I could talk about this all day long because I'm such a fan of you guys and I'm such a fan of what you do. And, and I, like I say, it's, it's a constant, 
um, it's a lesson in how to make this work for so long and how to make it work correctly. You know what I mean? Because there's so many, you know, and you know them all as, as well as I do, all the other stories of guys who got spit out the other side of this right. business that, you know, who were right. talented and had some stuff, but it just, you know, it just didn't go that, that their way. But I mean, right. there's a lot of, there's a lot of factors that, that come into play when a band like yours can propel itself forward and keep going forward and do it smartly and all the things that, that worked for you guys. It, you know what? I think that we, we have made our share of mistakes, but we have sure. learned from them. And that was yeah. what we all sort of saw was even, even, you know, super devastating mistakes were like, we can, we can learn from this and fix it and just totally. don't do it again. Totally. Um, yeah. You know, but the, the other part of it is I think too many people are relying on other people to sort of make their dream come true. Yeah. And that's that's always that thing was, well, I had this, but it just didn't work out. It's like, but it didn't work out. And you don't know. You don't know why, because you weren't making phone calls. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's it's a really tough lesson. And I think probably every example of 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 that comes down to that. It comes down to like rather than sort of taking charge of it yourself or you know, with your guys, with that, with your little unit, yeah. um, you hand it over to other people and they've got, you know, there's a totem pole of, 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 of artists that an agent or a manager looks after. And sometimes you're at the bottom of that totem pole and your attention, you know, you just get lost in the mix. Well, and, it, look, uh, in, in another weird way, there's also, as far as a manager is concerned, there's a totem pole of power in your band. That's true. That's and so, true. you know, if, if you're, if you're, in a band and the manager is paying attention to the singer, but the guitar player is the one that does all the business. And then the singer says, well, I don't need you guys. Fuck you. And right. then the guitar player goes like, okay. And then everything kind of falls apart. Yeah. And it's like, what happened? Well, the manager got involved. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. That, and that, and that, that happens all the time too. That, that sort okay. of like, uh, it's an, it's an ugly thing, but that's why I, I so admire you guys for just being able to kind of continue doing it. Like I said, you and, and Greg, well, you and Greg, you know, continuously throughout, but you, Greg and Brett, the whole time, I, that's, that's really a, a wonderful story. I think. I think it's, I think it's, it's a, it's, it's a mystery. <laughs> <laughs> but a very cool mystery. I think it's awesome. Yeah. Well, thanks so much, brother. I really, I, I've, I've used up enough of your time. So, uh, but, I, I, okay, wait, but the most important question. Go. How tall are you? Come on. How tall are you for real? I'm like six, four. How tall are you? Six, four. I know we're both about the same okay. height. Yeah, I like, I, I'm, I'm like six three and a bunch, like six three and just under six four. Yeah, I, I think I don't even know honestly. My, my wife keeps looking at me, going, "I think you're taller than six four. And I'll be like, "I got, <laughs> I, I got boots on or something." Yeah, I, 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 when the boots come on, it's like yeah, I'm six six. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> no, there's, there's a whole there's a whole bunch of us around that kind of like you know around that height. But I, they're making kids bigger these days. I walk through the mall sometimes and I'll see some clearly teenage kid who's like yeah. nine feet tall. I'm like. Yeah. Uh, they're getting bigger all the time. It's a sport. It's just, it's a just sport. <laughs> yeah, it's a height sport. Yeah. <laughs> well, I really appreciate it, brother, but I really can't wait to, see, when you guys get back out, I'm coming out. I got to come see some shows. Cause it's been, I'm itching you're, to see some shows. You're still Vegas. I'm in Vegas. Yeah. I've been here almost 15 so, so years. I'm only telling you this. Yes. For shows in Vegas. Really? Wow. Yeah, really? That's it's exciting. Just, just so you know. So I shouldn't have that on here. You can have it on here. <laughs> <laughs> well, then I'll I'll fucking be there. Then if, if that's gonna be the case, I'm Absolutely. telling you when it is. But I, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I know the first show is in Vegas. Fantastic! That's exciting. <laughs> I'll be there. I'll be uh, harassing you. Hey Good. Jay. Hey Jay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> come on! Come on! Come on! <laughs> <laughs> awesome, man. We'll say uh, hi to the fam and and all the all the gang, and uh, we'll cross paths soon enough. I hope. Oh, for sure. Yeah, awesome, for man. Sure. Okay, man. Right. Yeah. Good love. Take care. Bye-bye.